Okay, first of all, I want to thank Fees for inviting me. Um, it was actually very lovely arriving here in the morning. There was a lot of fog, but you could see the trees and the channels coming out of the fog, so it was really lovely. Um, so I was asked to talk about Cherenkov imaging for surgical guidance, which is uh, one of the things we do in my lab at Sloan. Um, so since I don't know who of you knows what Cherenkov is, Cherenkov light is, let me go one more, happens when you have a charged particle that travels faster than the speed of light through a dielectric medium, and that generates Cherenkov luminescence, CL. The simulation you see up here is a positron going through a tank of water, and you see the photons coming out uh, of the water while the positron is traveling through there. And you all sort of know Cherenkov because this picture here is a cooling basin of a power plant. I think this was in France. And all the blue glow you see around here is the Cherenkov. I was told actually by some colleagues I shouldn't show this because this associates Cherenkov with a nuclear power plant, which might not be the best idea to promote it, but you can see it very well here. So what we use are medical isotopes, positron emitters mostly, which have the positron. The positron uh, travels along here and generates its Cherenkov light until at some time point you get the annihilation and then you have the two 511 gammas. Now, this is a movie. Um, I don't think you can hear the sound because you, well, maybe you can. No, you can hear from me. Um, and as soon as I start this thing, you will hear somebody counting down, three, two, one, pull. And this is the UPenn research reactor, as it says there. You can see it on, on YouTube as well. There are several other ones similar. And what they do is they pull the control rod of this reactor, and then they plug it back in. You hear cluck, and then it goes back in. And this is what happens. So you still see some glow here. And again, it's probably not a good thing to promote Cherenkov again with a nuclear reactor here. But once they pulled the rod, you saw a flash of light. And this light is the Cherenkov coming out there because now all the particles are traveling around in the water. The reaction starts. And then when the rod goes back in, uh, it goes back. And actually, if I've given these talks. And then later on, physicists came to me and said, hey, I worked in a, a nuclear power plant. We have done this for years. We use it to gauge the fuel of the rods. We use it to see if the reactor is on, etc." So for physicists, it's an old phenomenon. Only in biomedicine, it only arrived in about 2009. However, this is biomedicine. This is where it's actually coming from. And it's interesting, if you read through it, Madame Curie was actually the first one who described it. And you can read it there yourself. She wrote that and actually went and went in there and pulled it out in her autobiographical notes, which is actually the biography of her husband with autobiographical notes. She says that they saw these uh, glowing tubes, uh, which looked like faint fairy lights at night when they went into their lab. Now, if you remember what I told you, you see it in a nuclear power plant. So Madame Curie went into her lab and saw it in her tubes on the bench. Um, I usually say, close the door, call radiation safety, and leave. Now, Cherenkov described the entire phenomenon. Of course, he then got the Nobel Prize together with Frank and Tem, who described it on a, a theoretical basis. And he said in his Nobel uh, lecture that he saw uh, extraordinary interests and many practical possibilities for its use. So what is it? Here you have a spectrum. It's in the blue range, and it drops down. This drop here is artificial. That's why I blended it out because this is where our photomultiplier tube in the detector basically is losing its sensitivity. It would actually increase further up here to the UV, but it goes down here to the blue and to the, even down to the visible, uh, further into the visible, into the red area. This is a pet of a phantom, and there are different amounts of radio tracer in there, and you wouldn't really know what it is uh, unless I give you the Cherenkov with a white light overlay here, and you can see that these are Eppendorf tubes with different amounts of activity, and in here is actually where that there is water and you don't see it here. So you already have the advantage of any optical imaging system that you have a much better anatomical orientation of what you're actually looking at. 
Now, this is how it looks in a mouse. This is actually the pet, and here's the mouse. Doesn't really matter what it is. This were uh, two prostate cancer uh, tumors in PSMA imaging. Same mouse, and you can see here the Cherenkov and here the pet. Big difference, though, was this took about 40 minutes to acquire on the PET scanner, and this took about five minutes to acquire. So some people say it's uh, the cheap man's PET because you can do it in high-sensitive imaging uh, devices with animals like an IVIS scanner, and you can put five animals in there and scan those in five minutes and not in the usual longer time uh, you need for a small animal PET scanner. Also, um, a PET scanner for animals even costs about a million dollars, and these guys, uh, these scanners cost about 250 to 500,000. So there's a clear advantage uh, for using Cherenkov even in small animal imaging. Now, at the beginning, there was some uncertainty. Is it really Cherenkov? Aren't you seeing Bremsstrahlung? Are you just seeing stuff hitting the camera? So what we did, we put some uh, black cardboard over there, and I don't, I don't even show this anymore, and the Cherenkov is gone. So it's not the gammas. If you look at activity concentration versus the radiance, the light, it correlates very nicely. If you let it decay, the light decays at the same uh, half-life like your isotope. And you can use a variety of uh, tracers, uh, as shown here. These are all PET tracers. Now, this is actinium, which is interesting. Actinium is an alpha emitter. And we thought, well, that makes sense. Alpha particle positively charged that goes through there, very heavy. But it's actually not the alpha because the alpha from uh, radio metals and from isotopes are not fast enough. You need an accelerator for that. You need mega electron volts. This is coming out of the decay chain uh, of the actinium. There are several isotopes which produce positrons in there, and that's why you're having added up so nicely. If you look at uh, the physics a little bit, you know that different positrons have different path lengths, for example, or different particles. Here is your standard 18F positron. What is shown in red is where it uh, fulfills the threshold. It's faster than the speed of light. And here, if it's blue, it drops under that threshold, and you don't get Cherenkov anymore. And if you look at it, it's about a millimeter plus minus where you got uh, your Cherenkov light. Now, this is Ichium-90 high energetic electron, and you see they travel much faster and much further until they drop under the threshold here in green, and you have a, a better a spread or wider spread of your signal. Now, the itchium, I don't think I have that slide in here, the itchium also gives you more Cherenkov because you have higher energy than the 18F, but the disadvantage is you lose resolution. That resolution here is better. Now, what I forget to mention is because I'm Pretty sure some people are asking that. Um, how can a particle be faster than the speed of light? It can be in water. In water, for example, the speed of light is 75% uh, the speed of light in a vacuum, and there can be particles traveling faster than that. Uh, no positron will ever beat a photon in a vacuum. That's not possible. But in uh, some other media, it is. And water equals tissue. Um, so enough of the physics because we want to go into uh, surgery and all these things, clinical applications. Now, the big advantage we see with it is that you can do optical imaging um, of approved radio tracers. So you can take your FDG and can do optical imaging. You can take your Sequonium 89, do optical imaging, your Gallium 68, etc. And that allows true multimodality imaging. What do I mean by that? You can do a PET. And then with the one and the same agent, you can do optical, i.e. your Cherenkov imaging. You don't need to couple a fluochrome to your agent or couple a isotope to a fluorescent agent. It's one and the same, which means your biodistribution is one and the same for either of the modalities. Um, that means you can also do a pre- and a post-operative PET for mapping, for example, and uh, do then the interoperative imaging, which is as any... Uh, optical imaging surface weighted, but I get back to that. And you can do some neat tricks by actually then combining it with fluorescent agents. Now this is what we envision, and I say envision, we're not quite there yet. Um, so here you would have a, a pre-surgical PET, this guy has a lymphoma here. Here you would have your intraoperative Cherenkov imaging, and then you can do a post-surgical PET with the same radio tracer, and lo and behold, Photoshop in this case removed the lymphoma. 
That's the idea. Again, you can use FDG or approved radio tracers. Now, you've seen nice images of handheld uh, gamma cameras and devices. And this is why I show this comparison, which is sort of unfair. This is FDG PET, and this is the Cherenkov. So this is a normal standard reconstruction. We didn't go high resolution. We also didn't go really, really bad. And if you look at the resolution here, here's the histogram where this line is put through. And this is one and the same phantom. The resolution is much better for the Cherenkov. You can even see those guys here where you have no idea really what's going on in the PET, as you can see here for the histograms. And I show this, if you were the surgeon, you want to have this. You don't want to have that, right? So the optical imaging, in this case, the Cherenkov, will give you a much nicer and better resolution. Makes sense. You all know if you go with your camera closer uh, to an object, the resolution of that object at uh, the image at the end increases. So another point I want to, uh, uh, to bring your attention to is if you compare Cherenkov, CLI means Cherenkov luminescence imaging, with fluorescence imaging, which we already heard a little bit about, uh, and here are the pros and the cons. With the Cherenkov, you can sort of detect deeper lesions because you have radioactivity, so you can always go back to your nice old-fashioned handheld probe and see if you find something further in the depth. You can, with the fluorescence system, you'll miss this one down here because your excitation light might not reach that. Um, also, with the fluorescence system, you have to shine light on it so you get autofluorescence and you get scatter and reflection back into a camera which degrades the signal. One big advantage and one big disadvantage of Cherenkov, big advantage of fluorescence, though, is that this is a very bright signal, and this is a very low signal. Uh, and if I mean a very low signal, I mean a really very, very, very low signal, um, which I'll get back to. So I just want to make this little diversion here. What you can do is you can build advanced Cherenkov agents we called it secondary Cherenkov induced fluorescence imaging. It has a nice uh, acronym then. And if you put a fluochrome in the path of the Cherenkov light, you get this excitation of this fluochrome through the Cherenkov. And the nice thing is FITSI works very nice, and FITSI is clinically approved, fluoroisophyrocyanate, and has also been used intraoperatively. And then the advantages you will get from this is if you look at the PET tracer principle number A there, is that your signal is always on. It is on when it is bound to the target. It is on if it's still floating around. If it's on, if it's degraded, you always have the signal. That's why you have to wait, for example, for the antibodies several days even uh, to finally get a nice uh, signal to noise ratio. Now here's your Cherenkov radio tracer, positron to get the light. But now with the Cherenkov light, you can convert the signal into another signal, and I don't, don't even show it on here, you can also absorb the Cherenkov light. So you can switch on another signal, another fluochrome, or you can absorb the Cherenkov light. So suddenly you get something which is activatable and you can play with that. Um, I'm not going to go into that because it's beyond uh, interoperative imaging, but I want to point this out. This is a mouse, it's a dead mouse. Um, which has a big tube implanted in here. That's why it's dead. And the tube is filled with FITC and FDG. And here we do standard fluorescence imaging. Here the tube lights up and we measure here and there and you get a signal to noise ratio of roughly 28. Now here the excitation light is switched off, but we still have the Cherenkov light from the FDG, so we still get excitation of the FITC. And now we measure the signal to noise ratio and we have roughly six times better signal-to-noise ratio. Why? Because we have, let me go further, here we have the ex external excitation, which gives reflection and autofluorescence and backscatter into the camera. And here we have an internal excitation, so we lack all that. However, if you look very carefully and closely, this is 10 to the 8 and this is 10 to the 5. So you have three logs down, which is what I meant before. It's very, very low light. So with this sci-fi, you get a triple information. Uh, you get your 511 KV, so you can do PET imaging. We get the Cherenkov light, so you can see that directly. And then you can put a fluochrome in there, and you get 
the emission from this other dye, for example, FITSI, which you could use intraoperatively. Now back to the intraoperative imaging. Here's an example in animals, a tumor, which was, I think, HER2 positive in this case. The other one was HER2 negative. And you can see that in a chunk of guidance, this tumor was resected. Here you see the clip. And here's the tumor, nothing left here. This is positron lymphography, which we described. And here's a lymph node. A uh, lymph node was resected here. The skin is gone, but the muscle is still over the lymph nodes. You can still detect it, though. And here's the lymph node removed. Now, this is basically, yet again, what I showed you. Here's a lymph node. Skin is opened, node resected. And here is the resected node. This was a melanoma. Metastatic lymph node. This mouse looks a little bit mutilated. Uh, the reason is that this was already cut off because the tumor was sitting here for histology. Mouse is dead. This was just to show you. Uh, what you can do. Now, I showed you animals, so what about the translation? And you probably may have suffered all this, what I suffered, radioactive exposure. I've seen NIH reviewers write, nobody will ever use radioactivity in an OR. It's not happening. And I guess you all know what that means. They don't know anything. Uh, so we had to go and prove it is, if you would use it, it's less than 1% of the limit of the personnel. Uh, at Sloan, we used FDG, we used the sulfocholates, uh, antibodies with, uh, with zirconium on it, and there were dosimetries done, and based on these data, less than 1% of the limit, and it's actually equal or even less than interoperative fluoroscopy, and nobody's arguing there that this is actually needed and has a medical benefit and that it's not really that relevant for the surgeons if they take care of it. And it's already done all over the world, which apparently that reviewer didn't know. Um, low signal intensity, I've told you that. And what I mean is with it's very, very low. The signal is about 1 billion times lower than the ambient light in an OR. Um, just to give you an example, if you have one of the white 96 well plates and you have it in the lab and you put it in a Cherenkov mouse imager, you close the door, you open the shutter of the camera, which is a nice sensitive camera, you think the door is still open because that plate luminesces just from the light in, the uh, in, in your lab, and the camera is so sensitive that it picks that up. And now imagine you have an OR lamp right next to it. So that is a big challenge. So you need to exclude any ambient light. There's no way around it. The exposure time, which I haven't told you so far, is usually in the range of minutes. Well, actually, I told it to you once in the very beginning, five minutes approximately. So you can't do any nice images as you see it from the fluorescence images that you can see uh, it fluorescent and you cut it out. Uh, that would not work. So the question, is it all at all feasible? And I got that asked, so I said, well, in order to get any money for this, we need to show that we can do it. So this is the first, uh, one of the first human FDG images we did. We did a couple by now, and the trial is still open. This is a patient with a follicular lymphoma here, FDG. There was nothing here. We did Cherenkov image in a specialized, sort of specialized room. This is the image from the left axilla. This is the image from the right axilla. If you overlay it with a white light, uh, you get it right here. All the cases we had had more Cherenkov on the positive side than on the negative side. Um, now, you may ask if you are thinking about it, this is one lymph node, and I on purpose didn't show you the coronal image because it's a nice round lymph node, uh, and this is not nice and round. The reason is what you have here is the axillary fold going through here, and you've got reflection scatter, everything what you would see with any other optical imaging method uh, of a lymph node or of any signal further down. Now, what I want to point out, though, is now, this node was 1.4 centimeter under the skin, if you measured it. And there was 1.3 microcurie in the lymph node. We could measure that, of course, with a PET. And we got it in five minutes acquisition time. Now, what about intraoperative use? So this is as far as we got so far clinically. Um, this is from LifePoint Medical. Uh, they are actually here. Uh, and I have no financial interest in it. They have, as a business aim, to build a Cherenkov device, or several actually. And they showed in a phantom that they have, here was about 0.8 microcurie per milliliter in this well. And within 50 seconds, they can image this. You can see the 0.8 microcurie. And remember, the lymph node had 1.3 uh, microcurie. 
And this has a sub-millimeter resolution, actually. Now, the important part is if they do a higher binning, they can go down to five seconds, and you can still uh, see it here, just barely, but you can. But the room light is on, and here the room light is off. And they are able to do this by shielding the whole system uh, with a tarp, or uh, however you want to call it, that is shielding the phantom down here from the room light. And the idea is to bring something similar like that shielding into the OR. And then you're able to image in five seconds. Now, this is a prototype fiber scope. This is not yet quite the, uh, the Cherenkov scope, but this is how it's going to be looking like, which will be attached then to such a um, tarp to exclude the light. So to conclude, Cherenkov imaging advantages, and I've put in brackets the comparison. Uh, it is true multimodality imaging because you can do PET and uh, optical imaging at the same time. I, uh, as I said, it allows for additional PET. You can't do that with any optical imaging alone unless you put a radio tracer on it and then you change the molecule. You can use approved radio tracers. So you don't need to go through the entire FDA, in our case, process uh, to get your agent approved. You can use FDG, whatever you have in clinic, and at Sloan we have at the moment, I think, 30-something tracers in clinical trials. Those you can use. Uh, you have a better signal-to-noise ratio than reflectance fluorescence imaging, RFI. Signal is though lower. You have a higher resolution than nuclear medicine. And you can do these tricks, uh, sci-fi, with an internal excitation of any uh, of certain fluorochromes, which gives you, in the future, some novel imaging agents, and we have some idea beyond the scope of this. Um, the disadvantages, and I'm very open about this, uh, it's very low signal intensity compared to anything else. It's probably the, the modality with the lowest signal intensity, uh, which is a challenge, but I've shown you that it is doable clinically. Um, this means we have long imaging times. We went down, or actually light point went down to five seconds in the phantom at least. You can't do really real-time imaging. With five seconds, I would say you're very close to real-time imaging. Um, no ambient light, which goes along to the very low signal intensity, of course, and this is the biggest challenge probably to make that happen in an OR, but there are ideas how to do that. Yeah, and it requires radioactivity, but I think we all in here know that this shouldn't be a major issue. At least our surgeons, at least some of our surgeons, I should say, are very excited about that uh, and can't wait until we get this in there. Um, so maybe I'll just leave this out. This is basically the repeat what I just did. Uh, funding from the NIH, after all, after some fighting, finally. Uh, it took a while. <laughs> um, many of these guys were involved, or ladies involved, in the research, and I promised Chris Kontak uh, that I show also this WMIC in Hawaii and the WMIC afterwards will be in New York if you want to go enjoy those. Actually, there are some very nice locations, I think. And with that, I thank you, and if you have got any questions, happy to answer. Thank you.